Romans chapter 2. Deal with the first four verses, but we'll read the first 11 verses. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man? When you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. Thus far, God's inspired holy word. You may be seated. <coughs> Humanly speaking, perhaps the most difficult person to bring under conviction of sin is the self-righteous. That man, woman, that boy, girl who uh, thinks themselves to be a cut above everyone else around them morally, comparing themselves with neighbors and friends, uh, justifying their life and thinking that they are accepted by God because of what they do, further rationalizing that they enjoy God's blessings so He must be very pleased with them. That was the attitude of the great majority of the Jews in the day of our, days of our Savior and the Apostle Paul. They were self-righteous hypocrites. It's probably the number one thing, perhaps as the culture is changing, it, it will vary, but the number one thing that we deal with, the number one kind of person we deal with in the Bible Belt, that person who's got a big inoculation of religion. And as you share the gospel with them, you'll hear such things as, well, I'm not that bad or I'm blessed of God, or, you know, my good works that way my bad works, or just immune uh, to uh, their need of Christ and salvation. But you know, in the hearts of all of us is a legalist, even as Christians. John Murray, as he deals with justification and redemption and applied, uh, says that, that the reason that people do not appreciate the doctrine of justification is because they don't realize the heinous nature of sin and the awful wrath just of God. So as long as people think themselves fine, they see no need for a Savior in whose righteousness they need to hide. But uh, we, even as we are in Christ, uh, can become self-satisfied, can't we? There is within us that legalist. Uh, there is that attitude that we are better than others. And that um, we contribute to our own sanctification. And that um, God must surely be pleased with all that we are. And to forgetting that, yes, God is pleased with us, but it's because we are accepted in Christ. And thus our sinfully defiled good works are also accepted in Christ. And we are to do them, but we're not to glory in them. We are to glory in Christ. Well, this is the issue now that the Apostle Paul begins to address in these first four verses of Romans chapter 2. In verse 17 of chapter 1, he set out the beautiful uh, glory of the righteousness of God in free justification. And then, just as I said, men need to understand why they need that righteousness. He begins to unfold unrighteousness. And so, in the remainder of uh, chapter 18, introducing probably the principle in verse 18, he first deals with idolatry, and primarily they're dealing with the Gentiles and the, their unrighteousness and the judgment of God that's come to them, uh, not just in temporal 
uh, uh, judgments and eternal damnation, but in giving them and their culture over to sin. But now in chapter 2, he transitions and he deals with primarily the Jews. Um, the Jews, the self-righteous, hypocritical Jews, and we could say the, um, the moralistic philosophers, men like Seneca, who would have considered themselves to have been uh, moral, upstanding uh, men uh, before God, but particularly the Jews. So I want to show you here from these four verses that God justly uh, judges uh, the self-righteous who deceive themselves in their self-righteousness. God justly judges the self-righteous who deceive themselves in their self-righteousness. And we'll look at uh, two things. In the first two verses, we will see the, uh, the judgment of God on the self-righteous. And in verses 3 and 4, uh, the deceit of the self-righteous are the um, uh, God removing the pretensions of the self-righteous. So first, the judgment of God on the self-righteous. Therefore, you have no excuse. Now, it's, here's a place I must commend the ESV because the New American Standard leaves out a very important address here. That is, O oh man, therefore, you are without excuse, O oh man, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you judge you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Now we can imagine that as God is uh, dealing here with the idolaters in the end, uh, or Paul in the end of chapter 1, that over here uh, in the choir loft, uh, all of the self-righteous Jews, they're shaking their heads. That's right, God. Give it to them. Kind of like uh, Job's three friends. I mean, they're sitting there, and God's spending nine, ten chapters through Elihu and God himself dealing with Job. And they're sitting there, oh man, yeah, uh, we were right. And then suddenly, he turns on them, and you are much more wicked than my servant Job. He's much more righteous than you are. So they're going along with God's chastening of Job, and suddenly God turns on them. That's what's happening here. Notice the transition. Therefore... Uh, you're without excuse, O oh man. The therefore takes us back to chapter 1. And the term, you are without excuse. Now in verse 18 in chapter 1, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now that first suppression with which he deals is the suppression of idolatry. And so he repeats in, or, or states then in uh, verse uh, 20, that they are without uh, excuse. Um, and so he, he deals with them. And then there's a kind of a transition in verse 32. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Now, he shifts to those who give approval by their behavior not by their consent. And he says, they also are without excuse. So the idolater is without excuse. But now he says, the self-righteous hypocrite, the one who's judging others, comparing them to himself, when in fact is doing the same kind of things in his own life. This self-righteous hypocrite also is without excuse. He is under uh, God's judgment. That's what it means that you have no excuse. You're condemned by God. You are wicked. You are ungodly. You are suppressing the truth. And the basis of this judgment is everyone who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. So now he simply can appeal to their conscience. Now, he starts that process, and I'm going to come back to this, but notice that address, and it's uh, rhetorically a, a very a powerful tool in even Greek diatribes uh, to you singular, O oh man. And that was Paul going for the jugular. He's going for the conscience. And so as he appeals to you singular, O oh man, he addresses then every one of you is under condemnation because you are judging others, 
and are doing the same things. And we think about this judgment of others. We think about the Pharisee uh, in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. God, I thank you that I'm not like all other kinds of men. I'm not like that publican. Uh, we, we think about the Apostle Paul who could uh, exonerate himself or the rich young ruler. All these things I've kept from my youth up. That's the attitude. And it's it's manifested, though, it ex actually exposes the sin of the heart when the self-righteous then condemns others whom he considers to be morally inferior to himself, but in fact is doing the same things. Sometimes exactly the, the same sins on a human level. I can remember when I first time when I read For Whom the Bell Tolls and when the hero at the end commits suicide, you know, Hemingway is, is really hard on that guy. And you know how Hemingway died? He committed suicide. That for which he condemned another, even though it was a literary figure, you saw his moral standard. But when things got bleak at his end, he committed suicide. And of course, we know the examples in the Bible of those who uh, condemn others and are doing the same things. And don't we do that ourselves? It might be simple things like how another person drives and you get upset with him and you realize, Man, I do that all the time. How, how somebody speaks to you and you realize, well, you know, that's, that's how I've spoken to them. But it's often even uh, in the, uh, it's not the exact sin, but it's, it's the genus, the species of that sin. And so the self-righteous, I don't commit adultery. But perhaps uh, he or she is a secret drunk or uses pornography or simply leers at women. Uh, I'm sure every one of you men have been in those situations where uh, an attractive woman comes by, perhaps not modestly dressed, and the kind of comments and actions that those men have to say about that woman, and which, by the way, ladies, that's one of the reasons you should dress modestly. But... Uh, they, they're doing exactly the same thing. What does our Savior say? That to he who looks on a woman with lust in his heart has committed adultery. Or robbery. And so um, we condemn robbers, we condemn tax cheats or whatever. Um, we can condemn the Clinton Foundation, but are our hearts full of avarice and discontent and greed? <coughs> This is, this is the basis, this is the, the, the exposure here that, that Paul is he's probing. He said, uh, once you put out a standard of judgment by which you judge others, you basically have judged yourself. You must be held by that same judgment. So the judgment of conscience that would say those things are wrong needs to be turned on you or on uh, particularly the self-righteous hypocrite uh, with a condemning glare, with the fact that they're under judgment. And notice the accuracy of this judgment. There's many ways that the Bible speaks about the accuracy of God's judgment. Oftentimes, you know, uh, the Tower of Babel or Sodom and Gomorrah, let us go down and see. It's simply an uh, anthropomorphic way, a, a, a metaphorical and logical way for God to uh, talk about the exact certainty of his judgment. Well, here Paul just states it factually. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls, literally it's according to truth, falls upon those who practice such things. So the self-righteous hypocrite exonerates himself and he doesn't pay any attention to his thought life, not realizing that thought life is enough to condemn anybody to hell, but God who judges according to all truth, who searches the heart infallibly, knows exactly all the sins that lie there and lurk there, all the corruption. And thus, when the judgment comes, it will come with absolute uh, justice, accuracy. God judges according to truth. And this simply reminds us, in the first place, of the searching eye of God. He knows us inside and out, doesn't he? Uh, on the one hand, it's glorious knowing us that he would love us <laughs> and to save us. 
uh, but also if we try to escape, and boys and girls, you try to do things because mommy and daddy are not looking, you know who is looking? God is looking. God knows everything that you do. And you're going to give an answer to God for those things that you do. And so it's true of all of us as Christians that we too must guard our hearts so carefully because God who knows all things knows our hearts. They're bare before him. And thus we are driven back to Christ. We hide in Christ, not in our own efforts, not in our own uh, righteousness. And so the judgment of God on the self-righteous. And then we see the uh, um, pretense of the self-righteous is removed, um, stripped away, verses 3 and 4. Two rhetorical questions. Uh, questions that develop Paul's argument anticipate objections. And of course, rhetorical questions get into the heart, the, the inner man. Do you suppose this, O man? You see how he continues to address? Uh, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. So there's two, two questions that God asks here. The first one, he's addressing the issue, um, I'm not as bad as those who are around me. I'm not as bad as my next door neighbor. After all, I'm not so bad by my moral standard. And so he addresses the question, do you suppose this? You really think so, O oh man? That when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you'll escape the judgment of God. You really think that when you compare yourself with your neighbor, who might be a real rounder, might be a drunk, a drug abuser, a wife beater, she might be a, a, an immoral woman, um, she might be slothful, immodest, whatever, and you look at them, you look at how they raise their children, and <clears throat> you're the Pharisee. Lord, I thank you that I'm not as bad as they are. And, and what God is saying here to the self-righteous hypocrite is, you know, there's no escape. Once you condemn them, you've condemned yourself. And it's folly to take another person, regardless of how good or bad they are, and make them the measurement for your acceptance with God. Because the only thing that makes us acceptable to God is a perfect righteousness. And even if, from today, you could have perfect righteousness, how do you atone for all the previous sins? Perfect righteousness cannot do that. Now, we hear this, don't you, when you're witnessing? I'm not so bad. You know, I live a, a pretty good life. And that's where you must begin to probe. I think I've mentioned before what William Perkins says when he talks about application. You must uh, apply the word particularly in order to quicken the conscience. Not generally. I've told many of you the story of, of a couple that had come to uh, a church in Houston. They wanted to be married. And so I, I met with them, which I always did. Encourage you to do that same thing and present the gospel. And so as I'm going through the law and gospel, you know, and sure enough, we're not that bad. You know, we're, we're, really, we're really good people. So I simply said, are you living together? Of course. <laughs> Do you know what the Bible says about that? No. And I laid it out, and one time in my life, ever, immediately the Spirit granted them repentance and brought them to Christ. And today, 30-something years later, they're walking uh, with, with the Lord, have raised two children who are now adults. But you see, you've got to apply it particularly when they say, I'm not so bad. Well, find out what their moral standard is. Find out... Uh, what they consider bad. And you can go that direction as well with them then. You say, well, all right, oh, did you, get, did you do this? We know this is simply a species of that. And so we answer that first question. The second question is one we hear a lot of, and that is, God must be pleased with me because I'm so blessed. You hear that when you witness? 
Well, look the, the second question in verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And so the thing is, well, I must be living a good life because God has really blessed me. And since God has blessed me, he must be very pleased with me. And Paul says that is thinking lightly of three things that God has designed to lead people to repentance, not to say, I am pleased with you. He, I believe, summarizes all three of them in this great basket of the riches, the wealth, the superabundance of God. Kindness, forbearance, and patience. The kindness of God is His goodness, temporally and even spiritually, to so many people uh, in the world. So many men and women unconverted, and yet God, indeed, as He causes the rain to fall on the unjust as well as the just, often heaps many more physical blessings on the wicked than He does the righteous. <coughs> There's a wealth of it. And then, coupled with that, His forbearance. Every one of us justly could have been struck dead at the first moment of conception, the first breath that we drew as a newborn, let alone all the things that we've done in our lives before we came to Christ and so much after we've come to Christ. But there's this wealth, this riches of God's forbearance with sinners. And coupled with that is His patience. I hope you think about the patience of God with you. It is a most wonderful, heartbreaking and rewarding meditation. I like the translation of, Gen of Psalm 18, with his gentleness he makes them great. With his gentleness he makes them great. He is so patient with us, he's not snapping at us. He's Biting our heads off and I've told you Piper oh and so much more so in the sense because they're not covered by Christ with those who in the world who are using these very things as signs when in fact Paul says you're abusing them because God designed them to lead you to repentance the goodness of God same root word is as as uh, kindness or goodness above, uh, is to lead them to repentance. And Paul does that in his preaching in Acts 14, about verses 12 through 17. After they try to uh, wor worship him, uh, he calls them before the great creator God who alone is God and says, uh, don't you realize he's the one that gives you rain? <laughs> he's heaped all these things upon you. He's been so kind and forbearing with you. Now I want to apply this in particular to what could become a wrong mindset after the election results last night. We dare not think that God is pleased with us and so he gave us perhaps a better government than we would have had under the Clintons or if, if we had lost uh, the Senate. Nor do we deserve it. So it's not because God's pleased with our nation and it's not because we even as a church and Christians deserve this breathing space that God has given to us. No, He's done it to lead us to repentance, to lead the church to repentance. That we've pled, pled with God, give us that which you've taught us to pray for, a government that will give us a gentle and peaceful environment. And so it appears that the church and Godly institutions shall have tax privileges that could have easily been taken away. How are we going to do that? Are we going to just sit back and continue in our complacency and arrogance? Are we going to humble ourselves and plead with God to revive His church and to reform it in these days? And as a nation, you know, it's always been quite remarkable, I don't know if you thought about it or not. Before God destroyed the northern kingdom under Jeroboam II, He gave them great prosperity. There is that richness of kindness and forbearance and patience. And they continued to harden themselves in their idolatry. And so God 
has shown us grace, in my opinion. But not that we may gloat, but that we might for ourselves and for the church and for our culture seek his face all the more earnestly in these days that he who has done this, what appears to me to be a, a good and kind work for us, would then bless it with that which we really need. And that is uh, church revival, personal revival, uh, and a nation that quits murdering the unborn, a nation that will quit destroying the home. Uh, and um, these are civil things and they are spiritual things. And we need to seek both in this period of time. And so what we see here is that God justly judges, condemns the self-righteous who deceive themselves in their self-righteousness. It's a just judgment based upon their hypocrisy and it's done accurately. And yet the wicked will deceive themselves and that I'm not as bad as my neighbor or I must be good because God is blessing me and these things must be stripped away. And in this, on the one hand, we learn better how to witness and preach the gospel in this culture where we live. These are the kind of people that so often uh, we are dealing with. And so here is a very useful paradigm for us. How to move from what do you think is wrong to the life of that person. But also, as most of you are or will be preachers, I want to draw your attention here to how to deal with the conscience experimentally. Because we need much more of that in our preaching. You see, Paul appeals to the conscience, you, O oh man, but notice as well that he's doing this experimentally um, when he puts himself uh, into uh, uh, his remarks and he says, uh, uh, we. And so he is um, dealing, focusing on the conscience experimentally. This is what we have been like. And then the use of the questions, which we really need to make use of in our preaching is the questions. Uh, and so we focus, we probe, we are experimental, we use questions, and these will help us be more effective uh, preachers of God's wonderful grace. Now, we all know of those who have been converted in seminary. George Scipione never teaches without giving his testimony to that effect when he was at Westminster. I know all of you, and I don't th think that any of you are doing this, but I would still warn you of the danger of trusting your own righteousness and effort to make you acceptable with God. Oh, maybe you've got Christ sprinkled into that a bit? But brethren, be absolutely certain as we sang, you cast yourself on Christ and Him alone, and do not be ashamed of Him, but glory in Him. And know that He alone is your hope. And not just for your justification. I, I recently just have, I commend this to you, I don't even know if they're in print any longer. I had read Burkauer in seminary, and he had set it on my shelf, and I started reading him again. What a clear, excellent communicator and writer. But in reading him on faith and sanctification, I realized that he was addressing, historically, the Kolbrugians. Their whole problem was people seeking sanctification apart from faith. And I realized that is part of what underlies a serious error of sonship, but they are rightly addressing a real need. It's not that pursuing sanctification is wrong, but it's pursuing sanctification without faith in Christ that it, we take hold of Christ for sanctification and we don't sanctify ourselves. The Spirit of Christ then applies the merits of Christ's work to us and sanctifies us. We use means, but we don't sanctify ourselves. And so we don't rest in our righteousness there either. In fact, the more that we grow in holiness, the more aware we're going to become. If you're really growing in holiness, you're all the more aware now than you were a year ago of that inner corruption. And that'll never go away. Brooke Howard's got a great chapter on sanctification and meekness. <laughs>
and it, it tied in so well with what we have here. And so rest in Christ. Christ alone. Boast in Christ. And when we find ourselves, all of us do, in legalistic, hypocritical condemnation of others, repent of it and flee back to Christ, in whom alone is our hope and our salvation. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this further probing of the apostle in the use of the law now with the self-righteous Jew and moralist and legalist and cultural Christian. We pray, Lord, that our own hearts will be searched by the Spirit, that we will reject all self-sufficiency and rest in Christ every day, repenting of our self-sufficiency. We pray that you'll make us effective witnesses and make us experimental, conscience-probing preachers. For very little of that, Lord, is is being done in our day, and we want to be able to do it and to do it better. Bless our covenant children who are here today. Grant that they will never uh, despise uh, the wealth of kindness and forbearance and patience or confuse it to think that because they are in the covenant that they need not seek anything outside themselves, Lord, and cause them from the earliest days to trust in Christ and Him alone. We ask these things for His sake. Amen. Amen.